So last week we started a new series and we are calling it uh, Soul Journey. And um, so last week we talked about, uh, we kind of introduced the, the subject matter. And so we were talking about um, just imagining that you are looking yourself into the mirror. Right? So those who were not here last Sunday, I want you to kind of imagine that you are looking into the mirror and then asking the question, who am I? And so you have reached to this level, body, mind, consciousness, you know. Then comes the tricky part. <laughs> because this body is so intimate, so personal, right? I mean, you can feel it, you can see it, touch it, you know. Mind also, so intimate, that thinking, and you feel like, oh, I'm thinking, like this thought is there, you know. Perception, you know so intimate, so personal that except for the exception of the sages, except for the exception of the enlightened masters, we assume that we are the body-mind consciousness. Just grasp it. Because it is so personal, it is so intimate, we feel I am the body, I am the mind, I am the consciousness. Bang. We have clung to it. That clinging, that identification with the body, mind and consciousness is what we call ego. I am the body. You are identifying with the body. Ego. I am the mind. You are identifying with the mind. Quote unquote ego. I am the consciousness, ego. If you simply observe body as body, mind as mind, consciousness as consciousness, not my body, my mind, my consciousness, then you are in touch with the soul. You see that subtle difference between ego and soul? Phenomenologically, we can also say that soul is simply a term used to denote the interdependent phenomenon of body-mind consciousness. A collective term to describe that there is this thing called body-mind consciousness. This being, you know, the, the beingness here, it's a bundle of body-mind consciousness. So looking at that bundle as it is, now that is as it appears to be. You know? That's so. It is as it is. It is me. That's evil. That's the main difference. So our journey is from ego to soul, basically. That's the soul journey. It's the, it's the journey which brings that ultimate freedom. Ego is the subtlest imprisonment. Psychologically we call it delusion. If you think there is an individual soul, that's also ego. Guys, there is no individual soul. There is only soul. Right. Sure, that's a good question. But first, I want to like clarify my position here. What I am saying here, please take it as a hypothesis. Please do not accept it. Neither reject it. Give it a 50% chance. Just give it the benefit of doubt. I want you to investigate it. Do not accept, do not reject, investigate. So, act, so whatever I'm saying, it's only a hypothesis for everybody. It's very important. And then you find out whether that hypothesis stands its ground or not. That's your job. That's the soul journey. So coming back to your question, uh, what happens to mind and consciousness, right? So 
if there is ego, then you would think that there is reincarnation. That is something called mind and consciousness. After birth, as an entity, takes another birth. Okay. So there is this sense of identification with it. So when you say there is reincarnation, then there is, there is ego. When you say there is rebirth, then there is no ego. Body, mind, uh, mind and consciousness takes rebirth. It's a phenomenon of transformation. There is no you, there is no individual soul that is being born and dying and by, being born again and dying and born again. There is only soul that is being born and dying and born, being born and dying, being born and dying. So once and for, <laughs> completely remove the thought of reincarnation and introduce yourself to the thought of rebirth. Very important. Again, hypothesis, please. As everybody is coming from different traditions, from different thoughts, different sanskaras. So it's important to... I'm asking you to give me a chance, obviously. So that's very important. So that's the difference between being soulful and not being soulful. Being wise or being unwise. So in rebirth there's always a brand new body, mind, and consciousness? In rebirth? Uh, transform. Rebirth. Right, transformed. 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 So not brand new, it's transformed. For example, I'll give you an analogy. Um, what would be a good analogy? This is a very difficult question. It so, is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, it's I don't, the most important question. Most yeah. important question. Yeah. Are you saying soul dies? Soul also dies and ego. Correct. Right. It's not you. It's not. But there is no individual soul. Mm -hmm. How can the soul die and be reborn? It's just a phenomenon of transformation. Here is an analogy. Milk. Okay. And I think we've talked about it here several weeks ago or something. Milk. Uh, milk turns into curd, right? Mm -hmm. It's a phenomenon of transformation. Milk has turned into curd. Yogurt. Yogurt, right? Milk. It's not like you cannot say milk is dead and now there is something new called yogurt. It's just a transformation. Milk has turned into curd. Curd turns into, um, what is it called? Butter. Mm -hmm. Butter, right? curd turns into butter, butter turns into ghee, a phenomenon of transformation. You cannot say the same milk has moved from milk to curd to butter to ghee. You cannot say that. Although the essence is there, essence meaning it started with milk but it is not the same thing that is transmigrating from milk to curd to butter to ghee. It's not the same thing, it has completely transformed. If you were to find milk in your curd, you will not find it, period. If you were to find curd in your butter, can you, can you extract curd from the butter? No. If there was something that was non-changing, if there was something that was fixed, like individual soul, then you would be able to extract it, right? You cannot extract butter from the uh, curd from the butter. Can you extract butter from ghee? You can. If there was some fixed entity, which like individual soul, we say, or a person, you know, then you'd be able to extract it, right? It's just our <coughs> deep, deep attachment to sense of self that leads us to believe that we are dying, being born, dying, being born, dying, being born. So, I mean, Sam, in, in your model, in, in terms of, if you take your model and apply it to the stories of children in India and really across the world, and, and um, you know, they seem to have a uh, recollection of past lives. Right. Uh, from your model, how, how do you get to the carrying of those memories right. in, that, in that individual entity that witnesses that the universe or that serves the universe? Mm -hmm. How is that carried across? Right. In fact, there are known stories of children, children especially, because children don't lie, so you can trust their data. So children recollecting their past life experiences. Absolutely. It's a known fact. It's, it's actually an established science at University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. Right? Ian yeah. Stevenson. Steven Ian Stevenson, right. It's not the person who has transmigrated from this birth to that birth. It's those memories. But because we are not introduced to the soul, we realize that it's that same Mr. or Miss X that has transmigrated. It's just a phenomenon of memory transmigrating from this birth to next birth. You're talking about lying to the soul. Right. Um, 
Transformation. It's a phenomenon of change. That's all it is. Um, what you tell people is like you're saying you're carrying your memories from one point to another. You are not carrying. The delusion is carrying the memories. For example, if you are enlightened this life, okay, there are no memories to be carried forward. What is that enlightenment? It's removing that glue. What is the glue? Glue is ego. Ego is like a glue. It's stickiness. It has the quality of stickiness. What it has done is it has glued all the memories together and created a delusion of a person. All the memories, all the sense values, all have turned into a mental formation which we call I, quote unquote. You know? That's why you feel separated from each other. You know, you think, I think I am Sudhir because the ego has kind of glued everything together and then it feels not separate from you and you and you. And you. So the ego is like waves forming from the ocean Absolutely. and they finally recede in the same sea and new waves come. That's now, beautiful. Why, why must the sleeper happen? Why must the sleeper Because of that glue, because of that attachment, because of the ego. When ego is dissolved, there is no transformation left, right? All the glue has gone away, Every, all the knots are removed, everything is, is dissolved. So, so that would like, be the end of rebirth. That would be the right, but end is also another yeah. misleading term. That is the end of suffering. That's the end of um, ignorance. That, that would be a better way. But but I mean, just look at ourselves. Why are we suffering so much? If you were to analyze that question uh, and analysis, <laughs> do it lightheartedly. <laughs> Don't test the cow dung to find out whether it is cow dung. <laughs> lightheartedly. Like I said, diligent effortlessness. Okay. But without analysis, you cannot do anything. If you don't like the word analysis, use the word diagnosis. Or if you were to go to a doctor, you want a doctor to diagnose your disease, right? Diagnose the problem. The more there is diagnosis, the better chance of recovery, better chance of solution, right? Our aim is that only. We are trying to diagnose the problems, the, the, the cause of suffering, pain, unhappiness, misery, imperfections, whatever it is, you know? We're trying to analyze, diagnosis, so we can find the ultimate solution. Such a solution that it, it completely uproots the problem. Never it arises again, you know. That's that's the, actually a wonderful <coughs> metaphor to, to use because I, I work in medicine and I've always tried to use that. But one interesting thing to remember about diagnosis is it's not always perfect. It's not black and white. Right. Right. If a patient comes and they don't quite know what sort of cancer or disease, they do what's called a differential diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Basically all that means is that they search for the for the clues of things that it's not. They'll take x-rays, well it's not this, but they black this, it's not this, so they can move in on what they think the true diagnosis is. And that's actually a nice way in terms of you talk about it, but not accepting what you say, but thinking about it logically and analytically and moving into the truth. Truth, absolutely. And one of the things that I'm I'm still kind of stuck on in terms of this what it's what if anything survives death is in physics we know that somehow our consciousness affects an experiment. Uh, it's called the double slit experiment. Mm -hmm. And so if there's truly I mean, if there's truly nothing that is self-aware or conscious, how does it affect these these experiments? Right. It's, so so to me I think that there's there's like this at the very bottom there's a sense of you said witness, and I, mm -hmm. I use that word, right. or the observer. Observer, yeah. And they use that in a lot. In science. Observer is not separate from observation, yeah. and that's where, exactly. that's where the quantum mechanics fails. Mm -hmm. you know? So we need yeah. a new form of quantum mechanical uh, way of looking at things, where the observer is incorporated into the observation, which is consciousness. And so it's, it's a wonderful new development. But um, yeah, coming back to um, um, analysis, you know, if you were to analyze the main problem behind our suffering, our pain, imperfections, and what not. The ultimate cause is this ego, this identification with the body as my body, mind as my body, my mind, consciousness as my consciousness. Ultimate answer. There may be many immediate causes, intermediate causes, proximate causes, pre-nascence causes, post-nascence causes. There are many kinds of causes and conditions, but the ultimate cause is 
ego and we, unless you uproot that you cannot solve the problem forever right and so our aim is to completely eradicate to remove that uh, problem to remove that uh, cause so if you were to analyze yourself the, the ultimate cause is sense of separate self if you are separate from others you know if you were to train ourselves to feel one with everybody you know then you see what happens miraculous things start happening just that sense of oneness beingness and that's really what the reality is you know we are really human beings you know it's not like you are somebody else i'm somebody else you know for convenience that's okay you know but in reality we are all the same literally i mean i'm saying literally if you were to look at well genetically we know now through genome project 99.9% genetically we are same Everyone different from a rat. <laughs> from from a rat, we are slightly different. How much? How much percent? Point two percent. Yeah, ninety nine point seven percent. We are different from the other animals, but ninety nine point nine percent. Believe it or not, we are same. I mean, just look at yourself, and for a moment, look through yourself. Let's say we remove the skin here, everybody's skin. What will you see? Same. Everything is same. Okay. <laughs> Well, you work in the medical field. What would you see if I were, if you were to X-ray everybody? It depends what sort of X-rays you use. MRI, you'll be able to see bone and, and different. But same. Tissue, but yeah. You will see the same. bones in everybody. You will see the tissue. You will see the guts. You will see phelan. Everything just same. Everything is same. You're so deluded in thinking that we're different. You know. Actually, yeah, in terms of you say X-ray, it's actually kind of a nice metaphor. Also, in terms of talking about the self and the difficulty of the language about talking about the self because if, if I was talking to someone that I'd never heard of an x-ray, you know, they live somewhere and they said, they said to me, Does, can you smell x-rays? No. Mm -hmm. Can you taste them? No. Right. Can you hold them? No. no. So they look at me and say, well, they're not real. And I say, yeah, they're real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's an interesting very, very good. the language yeah. and, and complexity, mm -hmm. which I think goes back to what we're trying to do here in terms of having a, uh, some language around understanding what, what's what is in the universe or Right, right. We're we're trying to purify our vision. You know, we're trying to develop that X-ray vision, maybe. You know, to look through. And the reason I mentioned skin is because, really, our differences are skin deep. Literally, you know. Like I said, remove the skin, you'll see everybody is same. You know. So skin deep. That's all the differences are. And if you have to look through the skin, that difference also goes away. You know, because it's made up of the same stuff. That your skin is made up of same stuff as my skin body right mind same thing you know when you're angry do you feel good Alan unpleasant when I'm angry I feel unpleasant same mind when you are in love you are in on cloud nine same with me right when there is compassion there is bliss when there is hatred there is burning everybody's mind works exactly the same consciousness we experience everything in the same manner, right? When I touch fire, I feel heat. I experience heat. You touch fire, you experience heat, right? Water, the wetness of the water, everybody experiences the same way, you know? So, everything is the same, really. So that's one thing. Second thing is this delusion that I am this body, okay? What can we call ourselves, uh, call something as mine? Tell me. At least I think that if I can have unchallenged, unchallengeable control over something, then I can call it mine. What kind of control we have on this body? Can you stop it from aging? Yeah? You can make it sit for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we have no control over our body, guys. But what is this thing called the mind? Sorry? What is this thing called the mind? Sure, yeah, um, we'll get back to the, the body part, but mind, um, but good question. Mm -hmm. If uh, I hurt my tongue, right. I suddenly can be performed on my tongue. Mm -hmm. Can I suddenly perform surgery on the mind? Um, yes, yeah. but that surgeon what is body? you. What part of the body is the mind? That surgeon is you. That's the difference between material and non-material phenomenon. Because there's an interesting question, because two surgeons mm -hmm. were having this discussion, one was a complete atheist. Right. He was a neurosurgeon and uh, one of the um, very devout spiritual persons. He was a heart surgeon. Right. The, the, the heart surgeon was the atheist. Mm -hmm. And um, the yeah, heart surgeon tells the neurosurgeon, I perform so many heart transplants for this and 
I know what the heart is. But what is this mind when you're a neuro surgeon? I'm a neuro surgeon, I've never seen this mind thing. Right, we're going to talk about the difference between mind and brain and everything. The problem is many of us get confused or entrapped with this in words. In, in the mind, you know, what is the mind and what is the uh, Right. So we are, we are going to experientially understand everything. The, me, the word... To me, the rebirth process, mm -hmm. two, I think, is two fold process. One, mm -hmm. coming, is process. Mm -hmm. one is the rebirth is, we are compared to do the rebirth thing because of our karma, yeah, our experiences, mm -hmm. yeah, unfinished business in this world, whatever. Sure. Right. The other thing is, if you look at the Judeo Christian view of death mm -hmm. or heaven, mm -hmm. to me, that sounds like state of perpetual assisted living. <laughs> <laughs> and many of us say, okay, I've been there, I don't want to be in perpetual assisted living. Mm -hmm. I want some challenges here. Yeah, <laughs> that's good, that's good. But going back to your question of mind, I'll quickly define what mind is. So when you look at a flower, okay, and you say, beautiful flower, right? So that which sees the flower, is consciousness. It's called I consciousness. You're experiencing the flower, right? And that which says it's beautiful is the mind. You're qualifying your experience. Beautiful flower, right? Consciousness sees flower as flower. Mind makes it beautiful. So that which qualifies the consciousness is mind. They're very simple uh, philosophical terms. Right. But, but, sorry? It's right. It's a thought which qualifies the consciousness. It qualifies your experience. That is very important. And we're going to go deep into the mind phenomena, deep into the body phenomena and consciousness phenomena. And we're going to discover that mind is actually made up of 52 intrinsic phenomena. We call it mental elements. There are 52 intrinsic mental phenomena that are collectively known as mind. Yes, the thinking is one phenomena, feeling, perception, attention, volition, greed, hatred, delusion, compassion, loving kindness, so on and so forth. There are a total of 52 mental phenomena that are collectively known as mind. Similarly, there are 28 material phenomena that are collectively known as body. And there are 121 categories of experiences or cognitions that are collectively known as consciousness. That's our soul journey. Why we are going to explore these three elements of soul, body, mind, consciousness, so deeply so that we can find out where all the problems are, you know? All our problems are at the level of body or mind or consciousness, right? Everybody would agree with that? Mm -hmm. We're gonna, unless we explore these three phenomena thoroughly, we won't be able to find out the causes of the problems. You know? So that's what our journey is going to be. And some of these questions will be answered more thoroughly, like rebirth and this phenomenon. It's a very, it's a very logical phenomenon. We'll talk about what exactly happens at the level of body, mind, consciousness. What happens before the moment of birth? What happens at the moment of, uh, sorry, what happens before the moment of death? What happens at the moment of death? What happens immediately after the moment of death? How the subconscious consciousness turns into consciousness? We're going to talk about all that. The whole, the whole thing. How do you know? <laughs> Sorry. How do you know all that? How, how do we? How know? do we know that? I mean, nobody finds that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's true. But we're going to know it through meditation. We're going to actually experience, for example, the phenomenon of relinquishment, uh, whether it is or delight or impermanence. You actually experienced it, right? Every breath that came ceased. None, none of the breath went on forever. So you now you know that impermanence is a real thing. When you observe your thoughts, you will realize the same thing. Similarly, you're going to observe death through meditation. You're going to observe rebirth through meditation. And that's the beauty of... Yoga and yoga and life and life. So, you know, somebody asked the same question to Why is there a rebirth? What is rebirth? Mm -hmm. So the answer was that when somebody dies, the soul is very different than what you're saying. The soul is there, and the soul, after some time, wants to go back to this world in prayers. And that's when it goes into uh, the womb of uh, a person. Mm -hmm. The moment it goes there, that is the most difficult time a soul can ever have. So after having gone there, you know, because for nine months there's really nothing to do, you know, you're totally dependent on it. And so then, when it is time for the body or everybody thinks that, you know, the baby, when the baby comes out, it's because of, the, you know, the difficult things, but that's not why the baby is crying. The baby is crying because now the baby, the soul knows how difficult mm -hmm. life was when it was born last time, you know, mm -hmm. going from being a baby to, you know, all those things. That's primarily the reason why 
the, the, the child who is being born cry, remembering that I have to go through. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I do that? Yeah. 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 I had gone through your slide. Right. And then when the baby is born, you know, you for a long time you see a uh, child smiling, he's crying, this is all his remembrances from the last in life that he had. Different right. again than mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the, it is that, you know, it has, the, the, the person has to forget that because, and that's nature, because the person cannot be loving to mother, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if he remembers his mother from the previous birth, and this, so that is the time when, you know, when the baby is growing up, that slowly and gradually all the remembrances from the last birth. Actually, want to talk about last birth or this birth, even if you look in your this birth, current lifespan, you will see that the present is there because of the past, the future will be the result of the present. Just this life, you will notice. So birth and death, these are just boundary conditions, transformational conditions. Life is a phenomenon, it's a flow, you know. So like you are saying, um, same thing you will notice in this current lifespan. And when you understand the boundary conditions, then the fear of death goes away. It's like just flowing, you know. Yeah, the person who dies isn't crying anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody so else is around him. But we're also, I think, as Radish was said, one of the problems is that begins to cry, but I'm not going to be not, it's just going to be my one bed. That's perfect. Great, thank you.